climb into the Uber and off we go. And so that's the first evidence we have of whose car she got into. Like you said, there's also the physical evidence of the blood in the car. So you went exactly where I wanted to go, which is as a former prosecutor, do you think that there was some type of deal on the table? Or rather, is this the kind of case as a prosecutor you say, uh-uh, we're going to put it all up and, and let a jury convict and go for the maximum sentence? I don't think you can give a deal or a discount in a case like this. And I know Roland's family has been very public in the media proclaiming his innocence, as well as during that bond hearing. But frankly, I see no reasonable defense argument in the case. The only possible defense would be someone took my car and committed this act. But again, we have Roland in the vehicle when law enforcement pull him over. And what does he do when he's pulled over? He takes off and he flees. More evidence of his guilt. It's such an incredibly strong case for the state. Um, I don't think you can give a deal. And that's why I think it's going to trial. And I think the other thing is we're going to learn in the course of the trial is whether or not any of the defendant's DNA is in the car during the stabbing. Were there any defensive wounds? Did she fight back? What did she have under her fingernails? All of those pieces of physical evidence that law enforcement gathers, collects, has tested to, to prove who did it. Now, the other part of this I want to talk about is, as we know, her body was discarded approximately 65 miles outside of the city. And so to me, it's not just things were stolen and she was stabbed 30 times, but also after that happened, 65 miles is a long way to go to dump the body. So to me, that indicates a, the, the defendant, the person who did it, absolutely understood what they did was wrong. Absolutely. There's no question in my mind to stab someone so many times, then use her ATM card and you steal her cell phone. I mean, this is someone that knew what he was doing and he should be held accountable. There's no question. There's really no defense here. It's going to be interesting to see what happens when opening statements commence next week. But I'm going to be really surprised if a jury deliberates for more than an hour or two on this one based on the state of the evidence so far. And it's going to be interesting to see what the defense is, if he mounts a defense, if he presents any evidence to say, it wasn't me, is he going to testify? Of course, those are all of the things we're going to be thinking about and watching for. I know that jury selection is anticipated on Monday. Nima, in terms of any other aspects of this trial, are there any other things that really stand out to you as important pieces as we look forward to this? What stands out to me, and we cover a lot of murders here on Court TV, is really the scene of the crime. The scene of the crime is this vehicle, this Chevy Impala, and the defendant is caught at the scene of the crime. That rarely happens. Normally, when there's a murder, um, obviously, murderers dispose of the body, but they also dispose of the evidence in the vehicle. So they burn the vehicle, they abandon it. But in this particular case, when police stop the vehicle, the defendant's in it. So he's literally at the scene of the crime when he's arrested. That's why I think it's such a strong case for the state. And that's why I wonder with the defense if they're going to argue any type of incapacity or incompetent. We don't know. They haven't yet. We don't know. We'll certainly be watching this next week. Look, pictures of him in front of the vehicle. And he was caught in the vehicle, actually, in the scene of the crime. So it's a very strong case for the state. Um, frankly, I'm surprised it's going to trial. But I don't see how you can really offer a deal in such a gruesome, cruel killing like this. And so you can see there on the video that our producers were just showing, she's getting into the car. She's highlighted in this video so you can see her for these purposes. That's the car that she gets into. Nima, what, what terrifies me is I know myself, my friends, if we call an Uber, especially if we're in another city visiting, that's how you can typically get around from place to place if you haven't rented a car. And this is what we do, right? We walk out and we climb into the Uber and off we go. And so that's the first evidence we have of whose car she got into. Like you said, there's also the physical evidence of the blood in the car. So you went exactly where I wanted to go, which is as a former prosecutor, do you think that there was some type of deal on the table? Or rather, is this the kind of case as a prosecutor you say, uh-uh, we're going to put it all up and, and let a jury convict and go for the maximum sentence? 
I don't think you can give a deal or a discount in a case like this. And I know Roland's family has been very public in the media proclaiming his innocence, as well as during that bond hearing. But frankly, I see no reasonable defense argument in the case. The only possible defense would be someone took my car and committed this act. But again, we have Roland in the vehicle when law enforcement pull him over. And what does he do when he's pulled over? He takes off and he flees. More evidence of his guilt. It's such an incredibly strong case for the state. Um, I don't think you can give a deal. And that's why I think it's going to trouble many times. Then use her ATM card and you steal her cell phone. I mean, this is someone that knew what he was doing and he should be held accountable. There's no question. There's really no defense here. It's going to be interesting to see what happens when opening statements commence next week. But I'm going to be really surprised if a jury deliberates for more than an hour or two on this one based on the state of the evidence so far. What stand out to you as important pieces as we look forward to this? What stands out to me, and we cover a lot of murders here on Court TV, is really the scene of the crime. The scene of the crime is this vehicle, this Chevy Impala, and the defendant is caught at the scene of the crime. That rarely happens. Normally, when there's a murder, um, obviously murderers dispose of the body, but they also dispose of the evidence in the vehicle. So they burn the vehicle, they abandon it. But in this particular case, when police stop the vehicle, the defendant's in it. So he's literally at the scene of the crime when he's arrested. That's why I think it's such a strong case for First of all, the history of domestic violence in this case, because testimony that we just listened to, and there was additional testimony that there was a history of domestic violence by this defendant, that she, in fact, was a very small woman, and he ended up, as we know, murdering her. And first of all, let's talk about that aspect. How much do you think the jury took into account the history of domestic violence in convicting him? Judge Ashley, Bo Pete Jeffrey is a murderer, and he deserves to spend the rest of his life in prison. He has four prior felonies, and he didn't testify, so the jury didn't hear all that, but they did hear his admission to beating his ex-wife on her birthday. He claimed three or four times in the head. We know it was more than that. She had internal bleeding. She had broken ribs. She had a laceration to the back of her head. Her ear was ripped, her right ear. I mean, just terrible, gruesome injuries by this monster. So even though the jury didn't hear the full story because he didn't testify and it didn't all come out, they absolutely knew that he was a wife beater. And I feel like that is, in terms of the defense, what really got him, because I felt like listening to it, the defense was, um, yeah, I hit her. I, I'd, I'd hit her. We had that kind of history. But I didn't mean to kill her, which to me is obviously not a good defense. Terrible defense here. And really, you know, he admits to beating his ex-wife over and over again. But what's the defense theory in this case? That she died because she fell and she had a drug problem, an alcohol problem, and she fell so many times, she happened to hit her head and died. So that's obviously a terrible argument, not something the jury was gonna buy, especially when he hid her body for weeks in that camper. So I know why the case went to trial, because again, the state didn't give a deal in this case, and they shouldn't give a discount in a case like this. And there's a potential Fourth Amendment issue that is going to be litigated on appeal, and I think the defendant, Jeffrey, wanted to preserve that issue for appeal. Trial on court TV, and we heard from testimony of two of his alleged girlfriends this week. And I wonder, like, what causes a woman like Patience to, you know, get in a relationship with someone that is a wife beater and is accused of killing his ex-wife and just to support him? I mean, you're really looking for love in all the wrong places uh, if you're Patience here. But turning to the Fourth Amendment issue, and you nailed it, Judge Ashley, the question is, did the girlfriend Patience have authority to let law enforcement into the camper because as soon as they walked in they smell the decomposing body um, they find the remains there in the trash bags and she had a key so i think it was a reasonable conclusion for the trial judge to rule that she had authority to enter into the camper and, and as a result she had authority to let law enforcement into the camper special place in hell for bo pete jeffrey i mean he is just the epitome of a wife beater, an abuser. We know that women are victimized in this country physically and sexually, and this man is a predator, and he preyed on this poor 
frail, innocent woman. And, you know, to attack her during the trial as an alcoholic and a drug addict and somehow violent when he literally beat her to death is appalling. And I'm glad that he's going to be locked up for the rest of his life because he deserves nothing less. Nima, this one is fascinating to me, and I'm going to start with a statistic that disturbs me greatly, and that is that 10 kids are missing. Yesterday, we talked about one of the missing children in a very small community. So I do have to agree with the sentiment just expressed that there's something rotten in Denmark. That cannot be just coincidence that this many children have gone missing. Judge Ashley, I agree there's an issue with the missing children, but again, Christian Bahena's own testimony doesn't even jive with Gavin Jones. Remember, when he was testifying, he tried to blame Molly Tibbetts' boyfriend uh, as one of the alleged abductors or killers. So, you know, I did live trial testimony commentary on court TV for this trial, so I remember his testimony very vividly. Now, look, there's a possibility that this Gavin Jones story is true, and as a former prosecutor, the last thing you want to do is convict an innocent person. So I think the judge has to do the right thing, conduct an evidentiary hearing, hear from these witnesses, hear what they have to say. But to just grant a new trial because someone said something in prison where prisoners say things all the time, especially in a very high profile trial out there in Iowa, um, I think that's premature right now. Prosecutors found out about it and immediately disclosed it. So they weren't hiding the ball. This wasn't something that uh, Bahena Rivera's defense attorneys found. This is something that was provided to them by the prosecution. Now, just because the prosecutors don't want to now agree to a completely new trial, um, I don't think that's inappropriate. Let's hear what these witnesses have to say. Let's see if they're actually credible. Let's see if their story has anything to do consistently with what Bahena Rivera testified to on the stand before we jump through hoops of impaneling a new jury and retrying what witnesses have to say. You know, when I put my head on the pillow at night, you know, I, I think of Justice Blackstone's theorem when I was uh, in law school, and he said it's better that 10 guilty men go free than one innocent person suffer and be convicted. And that's really how, how I feel. And, you know, we've been on TV many times together, and I take a very pro-prosecution stance, but if there's any possibility that someone's innocent, you really have to track that down to make sure that's not the case. News. A verdict is back in this case against Mark Redwine. Now, they have not yet returned to court. We do not know what that verdict is, but as certainly I may cut one of you off because as soon as they return to the courtroom to have the verdict delivered, we are certainly going to take us live there here on Court TV. So, Nima, here is what I completely agree with what Devin said, and that is there's not just a motive. It's not just he found these really disturbing, inappropriate pictures of his father, and his father didn't want the world to know. But it's also the deteriorating relationship, as Devin pointed out. This child, I, I, I do child welfare for a living. It's what I've done for many, many years. And it absolutely never ceases to amaze me what happens to children and what parents can do to their own children and what he's accused of doing in this case. This child, we know, did not want to go see his father. And there are reasons when a child doesn't want to go see a parent, there are reasons. I will stand by that. And so in this case, I think it's not just that the prosecutor sh prosecution has shown a motive, but that that motive, I would agree with Devin, is compelling enough to say there's no other reasonable explanation as to what happened to this child. What are your thoughts? Judge Ashley, I agree. And the fact that we got a verdict so quickly within a day, that bodes well for the prosecution on this Friday afternoon. I predict a guilty verdict on all counts. So we'll see when the jury returns to the courtroom. But that is my prediction. I agree with Devin here, and I agree with you, Judge Ashley. An incredibly sad case. You know, anytime a child is victimized, that's something that's heartbreaking. But in this particular case, to have your own father kill you, I mean, it just really breaks my heart. And, you know, I had the privilege of covering closing arguments yesterday. And, you know, the defense did the best they could with evidence they had. But really, they focused on the lack of evidence and they focused on the lack of evidence tying 
Mark Redwine to the murder with respect to Dylan's skull. And, you know, the forensic anthropologist came in and they said, well, we don't know one way or another if it was an animal, if it was a tool, if it was a knife. And they, they also focused on the lack of blood in Mark Redwine's home. There wasn't, it wasn't a bloodbath. There wasn't a lot of blood. There was some of Dylan's blood, but not a whole lot. But what the state did, which I thought was a very good argument was to focus on Mark Redwine's own actions. Are they consistent with a father who cares about their son? Because look, jurors, they're parents too. And they come into that courtroom and that jury deliberation room, and they're going to ask, why would a father kill his own son? And let's discuss what Mark Redwine did when he talked to law enforcement. First of all, Dylan disappears. He takes a nap. Then during the course of the three interviews with the FBI, his story changes over time. First, he said there was no injury. Then he said there was a cold sore, which caused the blood. Then he said that Dylan was injured because they were throwing a Nerf football around. And let me tell you the most damning piece of evidence against Mark Redwine. When the FBI is concluding their interview, they don't see a man who is interested in finding his son, who is worried, who is upset. They hear a man say the following, maybe I should think about myself. And that, Judge Ashley, I submit to you, is not a father that cares about his son. That is not a father who is concerned, who is upset. It's a father that was involved in the murder. And I think that's why the jury is going to return a guilty verdict you hit here. hit the nail on the head by finding a catchphrase, something that the jury can remember, which is, if they don't know what happened, you don't know what happened. The other thing I think this defense attorney did very well is to, to embrace the bad behavior, to embrace the bad facts about his client, right? And say to the jury, you may not approve of what he did and what you've learned about him as a person, but you have to decide whether or not he committed this crime. What are your thoughts about the defense's closing argument in this case? Judge Ashley, I thought the defense did an outstanding job in closing, but ultimately you can play only with the cards that you're dealt, and they didn't have a particularly good hand. So they addressed the good evidence or the lack of evidence. We talked about the skull and the blood, but it was really hard for them to get around the defendant's behavior. Um, they tried to argue it, but ultimately, I don't think they're going to be successful. And the bottom line is this. Let's talk about who the jury is going to like and who they're not going to like. They are not going to like Mark Redwine because of his conduct when his son Dylan went missing, these disgusting pictures that we talked about. And what about the argument he had with his other son, Connor, where he was just basically a terrible father? And then who are they going to like? Obviously, as you mentioned, this young 13-year-old boy, Dylan, who wouldn't love him? But also something that Devin talked about and you talked about, Molly, the cadaver-sniffing dog. The jury's going to love dogs. They love dogs. We all love dogs. And that dog alerted to Mark's vehicle, the laundry room, other parts of the house. And jurors are going to believe that testimony because I thought the drug handler's testimony, both on direct and cross, was fantastic. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're going to get a guilty verdict well, here. God. A verdict is in, out of the state of Colorado. This is versus the father, Mark Redwine still with me to continue talking about this as we wait for the jury to come back in to deliver the verdict. Federal, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani, as well as national civil rights attorney and former deputy attorney for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Devin Jacob. All right, so that was some more of the state's closing argument. Very compelling arguments to be made, and the jury now has to decide two charges that this defendant faces. The first is second-degree murder, and the other is child abuse resulting in a death. How many times, Nima, have you in your experience seen, based on circumstantial evidence, that a defendant is found guilty of a crime such as murder, even if we don't know exactly how or what happened? Judge Ashley, I see it all the time because we have murder cases without a body, without a murder weapon. So we have plenty of evidence in this case. Really, what the prosecution likes to do is tell a story to the jury that focuses on motive, means, and opportunity. Motive, we talked about the picture, means, um, you know, we talked about the blood, we talked about the cadaver dogs, you know, all the other ways that uh, Mark Redwine could have killed his son in this very rural part of Colorado. And then the opportunity. There was no one else that had access to Dylan. And I like the cell phone evidence. I like the forensic. It's because even after Dylan disappears, we only have 
four or so phone calls and text messages from Mark to Dylan. And then he just gives up because why? He knows his son is dead. And another good piece of evidence were how far the the body parts were scattered. The skull was approximately five miles away from the rest of the body. And again, that's just not consistent with an animal attack. An animal is not going to carry a skull miles and miles away. I think a lot of us attorneys believe in. So the father appeared more sober than usual. That's another statement they made in that closing. Nima, did you pick up on that? Not more somber, more sober. Was certainly an alcohol problem, Mark Redwine. But I like the prosecution's theme of actions speak louder than words because we talked about Mark Redwine's inactions. He didn't really help with the search for his missing son, but he actually sabotaged that search. And I think one of the key pieces of evidence was before we got to Molly the cadaver dog, we had dogs that were searching for the scent of Dylan. And those dog handlers came to the house. They ask for items that may have Dylan sent, and Mark gave them a pillow, the wrong pillow, and sent them on the wrong track. So those dog handlers suspected that he was actively sabotaging the search by not providing items of clothing that would have Dylan sent. So I think that was a good um, theme and a good piece of evidence for the prosecution. With a conviction on both counts, murder in the second degree, as well as the child abuse resulting in the death of the 13-year-old victim in this case, Dylan Redwine. I did want to let you know, when you heard the lapse in the audio, that is only because they were saying jury names, which we do not provide. That's why there were lapses in the audio as we were watching court. Let me bring back in my two guests, Nima and Devin. First of all, both of you had already indicated you expected a guilty verdict, but I have to ask, did you both notice as soon as the judge said guilty for second degree murder, you heard the crowd? And I can only assume that's the victim's family and the judge said, all right, be quiet, please. Nima, your thoughts first, please, sir. Yeah, the victim's family was surprised and they gasped, but I certainly did not. We expected this coming when they returned a verdict so quickly on a Friday afternoon. It was going to be guilty and justice was served in this case. This verdict will not bring Dylan Redwine back, but you have a father, a parent's only responsibility and primary responsibility is to take care of their children. And what did he do? He did the opposite. He took his own child's life. So. I'm very glad that the jury did the right thing in this case. They returned that guilty verdict, and hopefully Dylan's mother, brother, stepfather can finally start to heal after this terrible, terrible ordeal. Finally start to heal nine years. This happened nine years ago. Here's a sobering thought. The child would now be 22 years old, would be an adult. So I'd like to end with you and ask your thoughts about this. I was watching the defendant in the courtroom as the verdict was read, and the only thing I really noticed was his knee was moving quickly up and down. But he didn't start crying. He didn't act out. I felt like his behavior was the same as it was throughout parts of the trial, which is there didn't appear to be any um, overt emotion or remorse what did you think as you observed the defendant throughout this case? Ashley, you called it. You, this is a defendant that has never expressed any emotion, any sorrow, any regret, any remorse for the disappearance of his child. And now that he's finally been held accountable for Dylan's murder, he still showed nothing. And really the only emotion that we heard today was from the victim's family. So Mark Redwine, there's a special place in hell for people like you who abuse and kill their own children. So um, and certainly I hope you all find of, your peace. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry, Nima. I just was going to add certainly all of our sympathies and thoughts go to Dylan's family, the victims in this case, guilty of